Hosea 12, and a wonderful set of verses here in this passage that we will come to. We're going to talk about the, our, our title this morning is going to be position, Positioned for Home. Positioned for Home. Let's take a look in verse number 7. It says, He is a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. And Ephraim said, Yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance in all my labors. They shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. And I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely there are vanity." They are vanity. They sacrifice Bullock and Gilgal. Yea, their altars are heaps in the furrows of the fields. And Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet he was preserved. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall his Lord return on to him. Well, if you just turn that down a little bit more, just getting still a little bit of feedback. In verse number seven, God is, or Hosea is calling Israel a merchant. This has a couple of meanings. Uh, the word merchant comes from a word that means, uh, refers to Phoenician. It was a reference to the Canaanite people. And he was exposing through this their hearts position, where they were in their heart. We saw last week a little bit about his exposing of their lies. He says in verse number one that uh, uh, he daily, speaking of Ephraim, daily increaseth lies and desolation. The lying, the deceitfulness was something that continually was uh, come, that has come up several times now that God has said, or, it, or even Hosea has said about Israel, that they were, they were a lying people. In other words, they were trying to go to God and make a, uh, they, they were not really worshiping God or following God from their heart, but then every so often they would go and they would perform a, a sin sacrifice, uh, a, burnt, a burnt sacrifice, kind of like, okay, let me, let me just confess my sins or let me just do the sacrifice to kind of cover my sins, but they didn't mean it from their heart. They, they, they weren't really worshiping God. And God was saying, you're, you're trying, to, trying to say one thing with this, you know, uh, burnt sacrifice, this burnt offering unto me, like just to cover your tracks and just to get out of, you know, punishment. But really your heart is saying something different. You are increasing the lies. You are living and worshiping not the way that you are actually trying to tell me. And God knows the heart. He knows when we are saying one thing but doing another. He knows when we are putting a front or trying to act like um, uh, on, on Sunday that we're a, a good and faithful Christian, but then the rest of the week we don't act like a Christian at all. He, he knows if we go to him and we say, we, we, we say oh God, I, I do love you, but our heart doesn't show that we love him. In a marriage... You can do things to, you can, you, can, you can say I love you, but if a spouse doesn't see love shown through your actions and your behaviors and, uh, uh, and, and relationally between the two of you, saying it is one thing, but doing it or showing it and expressing it through your lifestyle is another you wouldn't marry somebody and say uh, uh, to your wife, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you uh, and come home every night, and we're going to spend our life together, but then every night be out with other women, right? That would not show that you love and are committed to that one spouse, whether male or female, right? Which, if you're the, the wife, your commitment to your husband, or your, if you're the husband, your commitment to your wife. There is a lifestyle that changes and shows your commitment to your, the one that you're showing or saying that you love. And God is saying that you are deceitful. The word merchant, like I said, it goes back to a word that means Phoenicia, and he is referring to them. They know the Canaanite people. The Canaanite people, they're the descendants of Canaan. Canaan was the son of Ham, Ham the son of Noah. 
And, and the, the descendants of Ham, through his son Canaan, all the Canaanites, they were merchant people. They were tradesmen. They were those that, in the marketplace, they, they would buy, sell, and trade goods. But in their trading and in their merchant work, they were known for being deceitful. They were not honest. They were dishonest people. In other words, they would increase or decrease the value of an item depending if they were buying or selling so that it would benefit them. It's the modern day eBay, all right, they, or Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist. They, they wanted to buy something from another person and they would say, oh, this really isn't valuable. I mean, I'll give you a little, I'll give you a couple bucks because they want to spend as little as possible so they lie and are deceitful to the seller that it really has no value so that they could pay very little, but then go back and turn it for a much greater profit. When they sold things, they would do the same thing. Uh, this isn't really that valuable. They would, uh, or they would build up the value and say it was way more valuable than what it actually was, so they could get more for the item that they were selling. They were deceitful. God is saying in your heart, you're 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 deceitful. You're trying to deceive me, even though God is not mocked. But their hearts were deceitful. You're a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. They got a kick out of being deceitful in their work. Nobody likes a dishonest businessman. You know, um, you, you, don't want, you, you want to be able to trust people when you are buying something from them. You want to trust them. Uh, as far as I know, the, 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 in the history um, of my last name, it was originally spelled F-O-L-K. And uh, uh, there was, back in the day, there was a forefather of mine, I don't know how far, like a great-great-grandfather, and he was a local businessman. I don't remember exactly what he, what he, what he did, but in, in town or nearby was another family name with the same spelling of a different person uh, that was not related um, or may have been like a cousin or something, but not directly related, but he was known as being dishonest. And, you know, the, the person in, 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 in my family her, uh, hit lineage history changed the spelling to not be associated with that person. He wanted to be honest and show that he was not connected with the other folk, F-O-L-K, that was dishonest in his, in his trade. The Canaanites, the, uh, uh, the, the Israel here is being likened, or they're being called, basically, a Canaanite to expose their deceit. They're saying, you're just like them. You don't like what they do, but you're doing the same thing. You're deceitful. Also, they were a cursed people. Uh, if you uh, think back to the story of Noah and his sons, they were, uh, it was only Noah and his sons and their wives and Noah's wife they were, that were saved on the ark during the flood. And after the flood was, was done and God had taken away all the waters and God had let the, uh, Noah and his family go out from the ark and he had given them the, the, the directive to uh, 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 now go back and to repopulate the earth and, and refurnish the earth and, 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 and care for the earth and, and basically like start all over again in a sense. And there was that time that Noah had uh, cultivated a vineyard and he had drunk some of the wine that had come from it and he had become drunk and in his drunken stupor was passed out on the, on the floor in his tent naked and Ham came in and saw it. And Ham, rather than covering it up or just taking care of the situation, we don't know all the details, but he ran and got his other two brothers and said, hey, come look at this. And the other two brothers, when they saw it, they immediately turned and they grabbed his, his, his garment and they spread it over him and they walked backwards to spread it over their father Noah to, uh, to cover him up. We don't know all the details. Uh, it doesn't tell us everything that, that Ham did, but when Noah came out of it and he learned what had happened, what Ham did... There must have been some mocking. There must have been some exposing. There must have, you know, obviously Ham uh, uh, did something that uh, embarrassed and was shameful to Noah. He cursed not Ham, but he cursed his son Canaan. And in that passage, it says that he cursed Canaan and said that he would be accursed people he would be they would live in servanthood they would be servants 
We don't know the, the reason for him cursing the son. Maybe the son was there and was a part of it. Maybe he was laughing in mockery. Or maybe he wanted to get a point uh, across the, the, you know, the intensity, the seriousness of the matter and what Ham had done. And, but he cursed his son Canaan. And so his descendants were a cursed people. And so Israel is being exposed and being likened to this people, Canaan. They were deceitful. You know, living in deceit and living a life of deceitfulness and dishonesty and lies is never a life of peace and joy and rest, is it? And God wants to give that to us. We find that in Him. Spiritually, we can search for spiritual rest and peace, and we, we can try to find that through uh, works and deeds and religiosity, and we can try to find it in many different forms in many different places. God says, I have a way for you to receive that. That's in me. And in this era, in this time, in the old covenant time, that was found through following God and God alone and not having any other gods before them. And Israel had disobeyed that. Today, uh, uh, it is found in restoration to God, but through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And it comes when we have the right position before God. God wants to give us a spiritual dwelling place and a spiritual home, but we have to have the right position before him to find it, to receive it, and to remain, uh, to enjoy it. We see a few positions in this pa passage Verse 7 begins to expose that, their deceitfulness. But let's see Israel's position. It's one of pride and self-accomplishment. So in their deceit, deceit is bedded in the foundation and in the heart issue of pride. When they are called out for being a merchant, being deceitful, right? It's like when, when, when somebody is being called out for, for something and the person responds, yeah, but I, this is exactly what Israel does. Verse 8, and Ephraim said, yeah, 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 but, yeah, but, yeah, but, uh, you, you say I'm deceitful, you say we're, we're dishonest people, but yet I am become rich, I have found me out substance, in all my labors they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin." What Israel is doing here is they're, they're, first of all, they're exposing their pride in their own uh, selves and not being willing to receive the correction of God. And they're showing their pride in their self-accomplishments. Look what we have done. And this is a problem even within Christianity. We can easily make our Christianity either salvation or our sanctification, our growing in holiness, all about our self-accomplishments, all about what we do. And we can easily take pride in all of our own doings. Oh, look what I do. I'm such a good Christian. Look what I do. Well, I'm holy because I do this and I don't do that. Look at all of my faithfulness. Look at me, 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 me. And all we're doing when God points something out bad in our lives or we feel conviction about sin, we go to God and we say, yeah, but look at all that I have done. And we try to expose our self-accomplishments. But Christianity is not about ourselves. We are righteousness. The very best that we can ever produce of our own and in of ourselves is as filthy rags, the Bible tells us. Any goodness is in and of God. And Ephraim tries to argue, well, well look at what I, I've accomplished. In this day and age, we see this in, in, in the Gospels with Jesus. Remember, he went to heal. He went to uh, heal someone's blindness, and I, I think it was the disciples. Somebody came to him and said, huh, so who was the sinner? You know, uh, uh, you know, was it him or was it his parents? There was the idea that if, if you were, uh, uh, had, had uh, either born in, in some kind of disease, it, it was probably because of some sin from your parents, or if you came down with a disease or, or a tragedy or a trial, well, it's probably because of, of sin in your life. And that's what Israel is doing. Well, God, we've become rich. We've become healthy. Look at all of our accomplishments. You have, you know, obviously you've been blessing us. Obviously there's good in what we did because if we were dishonest and sinful, I mean, would we really have all of this wealth and riches? Rather than receiving the correction of God, yet they're 
trying to say, well, we haven't really done anything wrong or else that would have not allowed us to become wealthy and into the position that we have. This exposes their heart position that, like what, is it only wrong if you get caught? They weren't really willing to be shown where they were going against God and his laws so that they would truly follow him and glorify him in their lives. It was, they were just going to go until they got caught, but now they're trying to say, well, look what we've done. We've obviously done pretty good for ourselves, exposing their position. Pride will always keep us from spiritual growth because we think we've arrived. We think we're good enough. Pride will always keep, will, will always hinder our walk with God. Whether it's receiving instruction from God, receiving uh, direction from God, uh, uh, where, what he wants us to do, or, or, or whether it's uh, correction from God, something he wants us to change in our lives. If, if, we are, uh, re, if, if we are deceiving ourselves and dishonest with ourselves and, and pride ourselves in what we do rather than in God's will and in God's word and in God's way, then we will remain resistant to what God wants for us in our lives. Their position was pride and self-accomplishment. Well, look what we did. Secondly, we see God's position. Verse 9, and there's a lot in this verse, and I love it. We're going to unpack it. Verse number 9, God's position, mercy and goodness. God says, okay, you want to point out all that you've done? Let me point out all that I've done. Anytime we want to try to measure ourselves up against God, I'm pretty sure there will be a lot more goodness from God than from ourselves. We want to show our track record of how good I am. Well, God's going to, God's going to humble us pretty quickly with, when he says, well, let me show you all the times. And what he does here is he's saying, let me show you all the times that I've been good when you haven't even been paying attention. God reminds them that he, was, that he had been faithful. For generations, verse 9, and I that am the Lord thy God. You want to follow idols? You want to follow other gods in your life? You want to, you want to follow and worship uh, 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 golden images? He says, they're not your gods. I am your God. I am Lord, your Jehovah, the God of Israel. I am the one who has been faithful to you your whole life and the generation before you and the generation before that. For generation after generation, I have been your God and I am faithful to you. I that am ever present. The I am that I am. I am your God. I always was, I am, and will be your God. God. God is a personal God, and he is a faithful God. He was reminding them that I have been faithful and been your God all along and now, and even in the midst of your idolatry and fleeing and turning away from me and following these idols, I've still remained your God. I've not changed my position before you. I've been faithful to you. He reminds them that he has been faithful and he is their deliverer. And I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt. Reminding them that, hey, when you were in over your head, when you had no ability or strength and a, 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 a position to be able to get yourself out of what you were stuck in, when life was so hard for you that you couldn't get yourself out of it, when you were in captivity, when you, were, when you weren't even, you didn't even have a place of belonging, you were owned by the Egyptians, you worked by the tasks that they gave you. Everything that you had was by their hand. You couldn't get yourself out of it. You couldn't deliver yourself. You had no freedom. You had no rights. You had no, no place of belonging. You had no home. You, you were slaves. And I delivered you. We were talking about this a little bit recently, this past, I think, week in, in our home. And, 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 and I believe it's estimated that there was about a million Israelites when they fled when they were freed from Egypt. Could you imagine that? 
You know, like you, you see like the old movie of uh, uh, Ten Commandments or the pictures that we see today, and it almost looks like, you know, oh, there's this group of like 100 Israelites coming out of Egypt. I mean, could you imagine, you know, uh, like, I don't know, like if, if Moses was like, all right, let's go, come on, you know, and he's sitting there for like a year, just all right, come on, come on, yep, keep going, keep going. God is saying, hey, the, I delivered you out of hardship, captivity, sin. What you couldn't do for yourself, I did for you. I am your deliverer. And he says, I am your restorer. Not only did God deliver them out of Egypt, the hardship, the captivity, uh, uh, what we often picture as the place of sin uh, uh, and destruction. Listen, God delivered them, but not only did he get them out, but he got them home. He restored them. Look at what it says. I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles. Some believe that this phrase is like a, a threat that he's going to put them back in this place of wandering, but really it's a, it's a statement of hope. It's a reminder from God of what he did for his people when they, were, when they had no name for themselves, no rights for themselves. They had no place of belonging. They had no home. God gave them their own home. There's no place like home, is there? Ever go on vacation and you get home and it's just so good to be home, right? And it's kind of like a sigh of relief. It's like you need a vacation from your vacation. You ever feel like that? Where do you go when you need a vacation from your vacation? You go home. Home is a wonderful place, isn't it? Everyone needs a home. The home is a wonderful picture and what God is doing is he is reminding them of the picture of his restoration. The word uh, tabernacles there in verse 9 is a word for tent. It's a word for home. God restored them when they had no home. He gave them one. The home is a picture of a place of safety, shelter. It's a place of peace and joy and restoration. That's why when you're tired and you get home, ah. When you had a busy, uh, a fun but a busy vacation and you get home, ah, home. You know, when you, when you had a bed to sleep on on vacation, but you forgot your pillow at home, and you get home and you get to get back in your own bed on your own pillow. Ah, when you had a hard and long day's work, where do you go? Where, do you, where are you renewed and restored? Home. Homes can take up and come in very many different shapes and sizes. And it's not about the materials. It's not about if it's a, a, a home. It can be an apartment. It can be a condominium. It can be a single-family home, a duplex, a multifamily. It could be a, a ranch, a raised ranch, a colonial, a split level. But the home is what happens on the inside of it. It's where we want to be. It's our retreat from work. It's our retreat from the world. It's our retreat from pressure and stresses. It's where we want to be before a certain time at night. It's where we want our children to come home to by a, certain amount of, by a certain time at night. It's where we eat together, have meals together. You should. If you don't have family dinner time, you should. It's a place where you hang out together, be together. You see it on signs. Live, laugh, love. I think T-shirts, hats, you know, every little home store and knick-knack place had that sign everywhere. And you do that where? Home. It's a shelter from the elements. Snow is beautiful, but especially from looking through the windows of inside your home, right? The, the sounds of rain is nice, but it's even better from under the protection of the roof of your home. 
It's safety from the world. When things are going crazy and things seem unbearable and things are upside down in the world, when work is crazy, when there's fightings and bombings and all kinds of of trouble and problems in the world, we retreat and we find shelter, we find safety and protection. We cling to one another in the safety of our homes and we find peace. It's safety from the evil one around us. It's the place in which we can gauge and control good versus bad, right versus evil, the teachings of the Bible. We can control and gauge the content, the entertainment, and the influences that are in front of us and around our family. We find peace in the truth of God's word and in the bounds of our home. It's joy. It's the place where we play games laugh together, sometimes laugh at each other, have fun, make memories. If you have or had children, it's a place where you've played with toys and wrestled with dad and listened to music and colored and drawed and uh, uh, played hide and seek and played charades and card games and you make memories together. It's a place of joy. It's life. Life happens. Babies are born. Toddlers start talking. Children grow up. It's a place of teaching of life. From teaching that toddler how to walk, learn their balance. Maybe you started with child-proofing the house first. And you guide their hands to hold themselves up and their feet to take steps. Teach them to say mama and dada, and then one day begin teaching them important things like how to fix a leaking faucet, paint walls, paint over the walls that they colored on, keep up with chores. The important one for every dad, how to hold a flashlight for your dad. And then the ever-important principle that will be with every single person the rest of their lives, that everyone needs to learn, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. We learn these where? At home. Teaching, instruction. It's a place where we make mistakes, make corrections, and keep on trying. It's where we sit up late and talk, teach about life, guide through emotions and changes and development and relationships, work ethic. It's where we learn who we are. And it should be the place where we learn to walk with God. Where we learn firsthand, children should see firsthand from their parents as we learn it ourselves over and over this very truth of the mercy and the goodness of God when we see his faithfulness, his provision, his mercy. It's the place where we live out the gospel. Living out the gospel is not only as outreach events at church, it's not only when you're at work, it is the very thing that we live out in our relationships and our family Biblical truth that we are learning, principles and applications of God's word should start and be lived out in the home. And in the home, as we do so, we live out the very nature and character and essence of God and Christ likeness. Tent, tabernacle, apartment, condo, house. When the home functions good and well, it's a place of safety and shelter. And it's a place that when you have a home, it's a retreat, it's a place of safety, it's a safe haven. Everyone needs a home. We understand as living in a fallen world that unfortunately there are times some grow up with not having that kind of home. And maybe if that was you, You grew up with a home where you didn't feel safe or protected. It wasn't a place where you wanted to retreat to. It probably is a place that you have tried to have yourself in adulthood. 
or you can purpose to have that. And the truth is, as God calls us to remember his faithfulness and mercy, that we don't make that ourselves, he helps us to make it for us. We find that first and foremost spiritually in him. God is our retreat, our place of safety and protection. In him is our spiritual home. And when we live out that, those truths in our physical home with our physical family, then we provide to our families and to one another a place that is that of peace and joy, shelter, safety. It's a place of restoration. Hosea reminds Israel that the home that they have, God is saying, you have a home. And he says, and I gave you that home even despite your sin and even despite your falling away from me, I gave you restoration. I restored you to be a people in your own land, with your own homes, and I will yet do it again. Why? Because I am a faithful God. I am a delivering God. I am a God of mercy and goodness, and I will yet do it again, he says. And spiritually, if we follow idols and gods of this earth, of this world, of our own lives, any other God, and God, the one true God, we put him on the back burner. God doesn't stop working. He doesn't stop being faithful. He is saying, I will still be good and faithful to you. And he is saying, my position to you will still and always be that of mercy and goodness. Because I'm a God of faithfulness, deliverance, restoration. And he also says, I am a God of continual pursuit. In verse 10, I have also spoken by the prophets. I have multiplied visions. I have used similitudes, meaning like parables or examples, by the ministry of the prophets. He has spent, sent priests and high priests and prophets. He has said, I have, con I have pursued you. I have tried to turn you back to, to me. I've tried to get your attention over and over and over, but you continue in sin. You continue worshiping this God of Baal. You have even given Baal credit for bringing you up out of Egypt, but I have been the, but I was the one that did that. And even in your adultery, your spiritual idolatry, I have stayed faithful to you. And I have spoken to you. I have pursued you. I have called out to you through prophets, through visions. I have given you images and pictures of, of who you are, like, like the very image that God gives through Hosea of the relationship between a husband and a wife, a faithful husband and an unfaithful wife. He has, he has given images like the vine in the vineyard and the husbandman. Over and over, God gave images and pictures to them or similitudes or parables and stories and examples by the men. God is saying, in so many ways, I have tried to call out to you to get your attention, and I've given you grace. I have offered forgiveness. But your position has remained prideful and and just focus on your own self-accomplishment, and you have refrained. You have rejected my call. You have rejected my voice. And he reminds them of what, thirdly, is the proper position. Verse number 12, the proper position is seen in Jacob. Remember, he referred to Jacob earlier. We talked about that last week. And even in, he says, even in, in, in the heart of Jacob, all the way back to your forefather, even in the womb, he grabbed at the heel. He was deceitful, cunning. That's in your blood. But even Jacob had a position of humility and servanthood. Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. And by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. Syria was a place that was a poor country. And God said, Jacob, though he wanted power and control and was cunning and deceitful to get what he wanted, like with his own brother, when he fled, he fled to a poor country. And when he was there and he wanted and saw the woman that he wanted to marry, he submitted himself and was willing to humble himself into servanthood to a, to a man who was poor, doing the job of a servant to be able to receive the wife that he had requested. And he got what was coming to him, right? He kind of got a taste of his own medicine, 
when the first seven years was, you know, uh, uh, was ended and he was given the wrong daughter, the wrong wife, right? And he was willing to then work another seven years. Fourteen years he worked for his wife. God is saying, or Hosea is saying to them, hey, even in Jacob, there was a, there was a spirit of humility. If Jacob had a spirit of pride, he probably would have never have stayed and never done what he did. Even the job of keeping sheep, tending sheep, the, the shepherd was a job that generally was given to slaves or it was given to, if, if you weren't a slave, if you had the job of being a shepherd, you were considered next to a slave. It was a lowly job. It was a humble job. David, the king, rose from being the humble shepherd boy. He was the youngest of the family. That's why he was given that, that task. Jacob was willing to humble himself. Bring himself under the subservient servanthood uh, role with a, in a poor country, under a poor man. And Hosea says, this is the proper position that you need to have before God. Where, where is the humility? Where did that go? Pride will keep us Not just from seeing God's blessing, because God is saying, God, God blesses because it's his nature of being good and merciful. We, we don't, God doesn't, God doesn't bless us in response to our goodness and faithfulness. He blesses, he does good because he is good. And God can bless faithfulness if he so desires, but what he's calling on Israel is to look back in their history that uh, even when they were unfaithful to God, God was still good and faithful to them. And I think if we all took time, we could see that in our lives as a church. We can see that in our families and in our homes. That even when we weren't walking with the Lord or even when, when times were hard or difficult, man, God was faithful. He was there. He was good. Why? Because God is God. And God is calling on us to see his faithfulness and his goodness to cause us to turn our heart's position to him through a heart of humility and servanthood, willing to uh, submit ourselves under him, follow him, and to serve him with gratitude, with humbleness. Position yourself to return home. Maybe there's idols or other gods, the things in your life that you really have pursuing in your life more than God himself. Maybe if God has been on the back burner in your life, he hasn't been really what you've been living a life of worship to and towards, and, and you haven't really lived your life out of worship to God, but more so out of worship to the things that you want in life, and you look back and uh, are really just just like Israel, can say, well, yeah, look at all the things that I've accomplished in my life. Every step along the way, if we humble ourselves, we'll see God's hand in everything. We find, though, restoration, peace, true peace and joy when we come to God in humility and we submit ourselves to him there is where we find spiritual peace and rest, spiritual joy, just like we have when things are good and healthy in a home, a place where we retreat and are restored. God offers restoration. And for Israel, it was to repent and to return to him as their true God, from their heart's position because God has not changed. He is still their God, but in their heart, he wasn't, their heart wasn't, God's heart was after them, but their heart was not after God. Today, God calls on us to turn our heart towards Christ. Jesus said to himself, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. We, we find our place, our dwelling place, spiritually, in God through Jesus Christ. But the wonderful thing is as we find our true home spiritually, that flows into the rest of our life. 
Because no matter how hard it gets in the world, no matter how dark it gets in the world, no matter how difficult it gets in the world, at the workplace, in relationships, and in trouble, with finances, with all the things that this life is, we can still have joy and peace. Why? Because when we are following Christ, when we are in him, we know we have spiritual peace and rest. And we can always return home. There's no place like home. And this morning, I want to encourage you, if, you've, if your heart truly hasn't been home with, with God through Christ to make that decision today to trust him as your savior, or maybe you've wandered a bit, but it's okay. God hasn't left you. His arms are open, and he invites you to come home. Find spiritual peace and rest in me. That's what God's invitation is. So let me encourage you to respond this morning by turning to God for spiritual restoration. You can't find it through self-accomplishment. You can't find it through wealth and riches. We, turn, we find it in him. He restores us. Humble yourself before him. Trust and follow his ways. Let's bow our heads this morning and take a moment to do just that. Re respond to him. Through these ways, with a spirit and a heart of humility, in any way that God has spoken to you this morning, respond to him. If you're a believer this morning, if you know for sure that you're a Christian, that you have trusted in Christ as your Savior, I want to invite you to, to take the next couple moments to respond and pray to the Lord. If you're here today and you're not sure that you are a Christian or that you've received that true spiritual restoration, I want to encourage you to turn to Jesus first and foremost this morning through faith in Jesus Christ. The ultimate picture of God's goodness and mercy and his ultimate picture of his pursuit, like he sent prophet and images and all these different ways. The law was just to show Israel that they couldn't, they couldn't receive holiness on their own, that they needed help. And God knew that he was going to send, he would come himself through the form of the God's son, Jesus Christ, come to this earth, live in holiness, and then die in our place, in man's place, to pay man's penalty of sin, and then raise from the dead victoriously over sin. The Bible says if we turn our hearts to him, if we believe in Jesus, that he died and that he was raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Turn your heart to Jesus Admit that you're a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. Believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus and call on him, confessing your sins and him as Lord of your heart and life to be your Savior. You can say or pray to, to God something like this. Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner and understand there's a penalty for my sin. I believe in Jesus as my Savior, I ask you to forgive me my sins and save me today. The Bible says if you pray, it's not, it's not the exact prayer, but it's the faith in your heart. If you prayed that, if you called on God to believe in him as your Savior for the first time, the Bible says you have been saved. And if you did that today or if you have any other questions, I want to ask you to stop by the, our, our table with our counselors in the back and let them know either that you you did make that decision to trust Christ, or you have questions about that, and we'll be glad to help you further with any questions that you may have. When you find spiritual restoration in the salvation of Jesus, you'll find spiritual peace in your home, your spiritual home, your dwelling place with God. Father, thank you for being a faithful God who we can trust. As we look back in our lives and we see your, your goodness, your mercy, your faithfulness, help that to stir and renew our trust and faith in you. 
for maybe something we're facing today or something that we may face in the future. Help it to stir us to stay close to you and to follow you, to trust you, seeing your love for us. May it draw us close to you. Help us to walk in it and to be faithful to you as well. In your name we pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for being here this morning and appreciate your, your time today. I want to share uh, with you a few things before we dismiss. We will have our growth classes in a few moments if you're able to stay for that. We'll have our adults upstairs and our kids will be downstairs. So if you're able to, to, to stay for our class time, you are welcome to. There's some uh, snacks and coffee in the foyer uh, out there in the lobby if you'd like to enjoy some of that. But I want to just share with you, last week I, I, I didn't really mention anything, but I want to just share with you, um, uh, as you are aware, we had our three weeks of outreach in the, months, in the month of July. We had a week of basketball camp, and then a week of vacation Bible school, and then a week of basketball camp once again. And um, we just, we praise the Lord for all that God did through that. We were able to uh, just reach out to many uh, children in the community, in the area, and um, uh, for getting that kind of back up and started, doing a basketball camp that we've never done here before, getting back into doing the, the VBS, things like that. It was, uh, it was a good mix of kids that we had, and um, several that we were able to get to know, even from the neighborhood and in the area and neighboring towns, and um, uh, it was just, it was encouraging to see uh, what the, who the Lord brought in and how we were able to, to minister, and really that's what it was about, was just loving and ministering to the kids and uh, sharing the gospel with them, so thank you for those that came out. Uh, we had a great time getting to know some mission teams from these other churches, and um, really able to make some new friends in that way. Um, and all of those teams, when they left, they they just they thanked us for for letting them come here and serve here. And um, several of them individually or the leaders of their groups, um, which were pastors of their churches, um, just let us know their commitment to pray for us and uh, even looking forward to coming back and uh, helping with these things again in the future. And so it was even neat just to, to meet them and uh, see how God is using them, a church from churches that are larger, and they have the capacity to send mission teams out to places that can use the help. And uh, so it was, it was just a blessing to serve with them and uh, with you and with them and to see that all that God did. So just wanted to give you a little bit of, <clears throat> of a recap on that. But Everything went, went really well and just really pleased with all that God did. Um, ladies Fellowship coming up on Saturday, August 17th. There are some sign-up sheets for that in the back. Um, I think is it one that if you're attending and then, or just if you're bringing something, but there, there'll be a brunch time. And um, if you can sign up to bring something uh, for the brunch, and if you're going to be there uh, Saturday the 17th from 10 to 12. And so all ladies are invited um, grade sixth grade and up, um, you are uh, uh, invited to that. So come in and have a good time with that. I know they, they're always, it always is a good time. And so mark that down August 17th from 10 to 12. And if you can bring something, you can sign up for that. If you, if you can't bring anything, that's okay. Just come and be a part of that time of fellowship with the ladies as well. All right. We will uh, resume our midweek Bible study this Wednesday at seven o'clock. If you can join us for that, we'll meet right up here and have a time of Bible study and uh, uh, get back into to doing that. So looking forward to that. Let's stand together. If you have an offering, uh, the box is in the back, of course. You can do that online. And I appreciate your faithfulness to giving to the work of this ministry um, that we do each and every week. All right, we'll stand and we'll close in prayer. I didn't tell him I was going to do this, but Sam, would you come and close this in a word of prayer? Would you mind doing that? Come on up. Um, I, I, I don't want to uh, make a big deal, but um, I, I just wanted to, if, in case you have had any questions, um, just to kind of give you the, the, the layout, Sam is basically here for free labor. No, I'm just kidding. Um, um, I, one of these days, we'll have him just share the story from his perspective. But um, he has just had a heart to, he was praying about some next steps for him in his life and what, what God wanted for him to do with his life. And, um, and he was talking with his students or youth pastor and who knew me, and, and he, was, he felt like the Lord leading him to, to go somewhere to give himself to just serving the Lord and, and, and the church, whether on a mission field or even here. And, um, and so his youth pastor was a friend of mine and said, hey, how about the mission field of Massachusetts? And uh, there's several things that God had already lined up, like family and friends in the area, housing and all of that. And 
Um, and, and so if you were wondering, like I didn't bring him on as far like, like we're paying him. I hate to say it that way, but he came with that understanding. Um, so if you're like, man, how are we paying? Like, he's, just, he's just here to serve. And um, I said before, he's not here to replace anybody either. He's just here to serve along with us. And he just wanted to give himself for the next couple of years, um, you know, the next two to, you know, 20, 30 years to uh, serving. And all, in, in his heart of just seeking what the Lord would have, the Lord led him to come here, and so two days a week, he's, he's committed to come in and work with me here at the church, um, and just, we're going to take one day, and I'm going to talk a lot to him, and uh, like Phil warned him earlier that I talk a lot, as you're sitting there thinking right now, will he stop this morning sometime, and, uh, but we'll, we'll just, it'll be ministry, and he'll, he's going to get involved in some ministries in the church, and um, uh, again, not to replace anybody, but to just be alongside of us and to help us. There's some ministries we've talked about that he can help start and give him something to maybe start and develop and just get experience in the work of the ministry from that perspective. Uh, talk Bible and just do Bible study and just development. And so uh, we'll have a day of ministry work and development and help and then a day where he'll help with property and grounds and um, uh, just give himself to that. And so uh, really it's just from a heart of, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then being willing to move from North Carolina to uh, Massachusetts, so um, his so it, it all very ha happened very fast. Like last week when he was here, it was the first time I saw him in person, and the first time we even met his parents. And then it dawned on me we're we're, we're like a, we're ending the service and they're about to leave, and I'm like, oh, his parents are like leaving him here, you know, like like, like the first kid going off to college, but they said goodbyes there in the lobby, and um, I had a good time getting to know them. His dad travels for work quite a bit. He may be uh, able to stop back up here from time to time, but it was just really neat. I know that I probably, you probably feel like I gave you the whole story, but that's just a part of it. But I just want you to get to know him and know why he's here, this kid from North Carolina, this kid with that southern accent, and uh, he'll be just doing things with me during the week, um, but just here to serve. So you'll see him get involved in different ways. You may see him part of the, the service up here on Sundays at times or uh, in kids' classes. He might be kind of like here, there, and everywhere for a little bit uh, as we kind of develop into honing him into main strengths and giftings that God has given him and where we can really work at developing some skills and, and ministries in and through him. So I appreciate that and his uh, willingness to do so, but um, that is just in a nutshell if, if you weren't here a few weeks ago when I shared it um, a, a little bit. But if you have any questions, you can ask him or me, but just wanted to get him up here in front of you and uh, uh, love on him, welcome him in, and uh, treat him kindly. He's here to just be one of us, all right? Why don't you close us in a word of prayer? Go bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us. Thank you for your word so freely given and accessible to us. Thank you for Pastor Joe and this word he's given us. I pray you help it to settle in our hearts that we may serve you and find our rest and find our home in you throughout the week. Uh, may we live for your will and live according to your purpose for us all week. I pray for safe travels and a blessed rest of the day and week. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.